Hello and welcome. You're listening to The Power Reclamation Show, where we explore the mysteries, heartbreaks, and resiliency of the human experience. Together, we'll focus on rewilding ourselves through raising consciousness and dismantling domestication. This is a collective journey of challenging hierarchical systems of power over, as well as our own personal conditioning and limiting belief systems. This show is about embodying the power of love, presence, and our own inner authority. All right. So I want to just tell you both how grateful I am that you said yes to this, Rix and Rob. Thank you for being here and exploring wherever we go today. Um, but I thought I'd give the listeners an, a sense of we've d- done a little powwow on the side and, and we, we've talked about diving into the the journey of integral leadership, but really looking at it through the lens of shadow. And what is it? And what does that look like in within ourselves, in the systems that we live in? And as we were speaking about it, um, I think initially the conversation was going to be about something that you've been doing in the world, Rixed, with some executives or an executive where you've gone through, you've designed, delivered, and you're in the process of integrating an entire journey and an arc for someone who, a, a leader who wanted to explore shadow, mm-hmm. this person's shadow. And so we're going to break this down and that's going to be our second episode. So we're going to do, we're going to have two episodes together. The first one today is just going to be laying the framework together around what are these terms? How does this live in our lives? What does it look like with our clients? And and then the second one, Rex, we want to just draw the wisdom from your experience and learn more about what you did with this particular leader. Yeah, so. happy to do so. Thank you so much for having me and, and uh, also Rob in this conversation. Looking forward to it. Great. Me too. Yeah. Yeah, it great just, to be here with you both. Me too. And it feels so timely. Um, Before we jump in, I just think in terms of the context of we're living in a world that for me just continues to feel more polarizing. And I think it's because it's my passion right now of really studying power systems, power over domination. What does that look like in the world? And it's so amazing to me how probably because my attention is on it, I'm just so incredibly aware of the pain and the heartbreak of how separation is occurring when when there's so much identification with fear and domination and scarcity and control. And it's such a big part of the shadow that is also the gift that we're all here to integrate and play with. So it's timely for me because I have so much passion around particularly what's happening systemically in the world and mm-hmm. how... I find myself, I've been really enjoying rereading Charles Eisenstein's book, um, The Heart. Wait, now I'm going to forget the name of it. The Most Beautiful World Our Heart Knows is Possible. Hmm. And I know he's just framing this way of separation and the journey of what it takes for each of us individually to create a world that is not based on violence, that's not based on a sense of basically domination. So... That's one of the reasons I'm really excited about this and also the fact that we're all playing in the leadership field and helping brave and courageous leaders who want to change culture and and really integrate more of themselves. So with all of that, I thought what we could do is just open up with what is shadow? What is shadow work? What is shadow? What are different potentially layers? I know, Rix, you have some ideas that you could share about some layers. So Let's just open the framework and whoever wants to begin, like, what is shadow and why does it matter? Mm. Yeah, I guess (laughs) going right to the heart of the conversation and Mm rewrite. Yeah. And um, I wish I could just give a simple answer to that. (laughs) Like, this is it, right? (laughs) Uh, But I'm afraid I can't um, as I'm learning myself and also seeing that shadow or shadow work has so many um, elements to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I guess that's why we're also together, right, to explore uh, this topic. But I think if we could say one thing about shadow, it's how um, Carl Jung defined it. Um, One of the, um, you know, the the founding fathers of uh, psychotherapy 
And he defined the shadow as the opposite choice of the choice we make, mm-hmm. which I think um, you can put on the different layers. Um, you know, you can put it on the day-to-day choices that you make, um, on the little decisions that you make, um, but you could also put it on what I call the shadow self, like the bigger, the whole of you that you are becoming. And um, the other choice, maybe, that would also be possible. And then there is, you know, the collective shadow, the, the collection of all the decisions, choices we make, and the opposite of that. Um, so um, to, to keep it small, I like... I like starting with small, right? To mm-hmm. to kind of define what is the shadow. It's the opposite um, choice of the choice we make, and and with that, um, we start to expand our consciousness and um, become aware of the parts that are suppressed uh, within us, mm-hmm. or they lie dormant or frozen within us. Mm -hmm. And if we are able to connect with those parts, then we're connecting with the shadow and we are expanding our capabilities and our choices of um, who we are becoming. Yeah. Okay. So I know there's more, but I want to come back to the statement because I notice my mind is trying to process opposite choice of the choice we make. Is that, can you say, either of you say a little bit more about how you would translate that in like your world or it feels very theoretical and I'm trying, it, for me, and I'm trying to break it down of like, what does that feel like in my system? What does that look like on a daily basis? Could you say more about that, one of you? Shall I go ahead first, Ron? Yeah, and then I, I'm happy to offer maybe another, uh, and we can keep playing with different definitions and roll yeah. around a little bit. Exactly, because it's probably not the only definition, right? But let's say, um, so let's say you prefer um, listening over talking. And so mostly when you're in meetings, you, 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 you tend to listen more than you talk. So the opposite choice would be to speak more than you listen, mm-hmm. right? To kind of play with that behavior as well. Beautiful. Or let's say you're you're always, you know, you get along, you go with the flow, you take it easy. Uh, would you be able to organize a demonstration or go out in the street and, you know, pr- uh, organize a protest or something? So mm-hmm. can you be the opposite or can you make opposite choices? And maybe it's not so much about doing that, but just considering that that would also be an option. Mm -hmm. Um, so I will turn 50 this year and I'm playing with the thought of having this big party, right? When it's Mm -hmm. possible again in the garden with a band, food, you know, Mm -hmm. hundred people, something like that. Right. But can I also consider, um, celebrating it with one friend, my best friend, maybe, or three friends, or maybe not celebrating it at all and just, um, keeping it quiet. Um, so just kind of considering those options and not, um, just following blindly my, um, preference or bias, but just, um, opening up this wider range, um, kind of maybe reinventing, expanding myself. Mm. Wonderful. That was so helpful. I feel like, what, and I want to hear from you, Rob, I just want to say one piece. It feels like what you're actually saying in this definition is like, how do we get to know other parts of ourselves? So maybe we do something habitually because it's more of our temperament. But what if we had, what if the introvert, introverted part of us really has this desire to create a huge event and be an activist on the street, but we just don't, we don't recognize that in ourselves and what's that like to just play it out as a possibility even if you don't do it that's what I was hearing you say so Mm -hmm. thank you for framing Rob do you have anything you want to add or another layer here yeah it's great I mean what I love about that definition Rix is you're you're already into the work right even just by considering what's the other choice that could be available you're now going to start exposing well, why do I unconsciously have one preference over another? And Mm -hmm. um, so that one of the definitions of shadow that I've heard is sort of any aspect of 
self, any psycho-emotional or, or energetic material or behaviors or traits that are a part of you that you've externalized, you've, you've not allowed to be a part of your identity for whatever reason, conditioning and defense mechanisms and things like that. And it shows up mostly because we make it not okay somewhere else, or we project it elsewhere. Mm-hmm. I think one of the common misconceptions about shadow is that it has to be like dark or negative aspects. And we've talked about this, but like, there's also the concept of a golden shadow. I actually project greatness that I can't have. I can't be, I can't have as part of my identity and we put it outside of us. Mm -hmm. And so any aspect that we've removed from our own identity, not allowed to be a part of us, and we put it outside is, is one other definition of the shadow. And so the process of acting at integral is integration is sort of a re first an awareness of, and then a reclaiming of, and a practicing into those greater options. That's part of why I love that. You're already talking about what do we do about this? And that's a very practical, very, uh, I imagine that's really powerful. Even just asking that question. Mm-hmm. What's another option that's available? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's it's almost like, um, and I think it's also what you're referring to, Rob. It's um, it's like the identity that you created for yourself is becoming too small. Mm-hmm. So the system is at its max, and the the only alternative way to is to look at options that you've never considered before. Um, because you just didn't see them maybe. Um, and, um, but they lie within you, but you don't identify with it or, um, what you said, Rob, you you project, right? So it's something that irritates you about other people or it makes you, you know, puke a little bit when you hear that, like, I would never do that, right? (laughs) Well, those are the options that are worth considering, maybe, because that's pro- those are the hints, you know, I think, from the shadow. The shadow comes to you often in a bit ugly way. It's mm-hmm. never nice. <laughs> so they, I think they come to you in maybe dreams that are a bit upsetting or, um, you know, what uh, irritates you about other people. Um, or maybe, you know, a little panic attack or uh, uncomfortable feeling about something that that you you're kind of used to do a certain way and all of a sudden it feels like you're limiting yourself in a way um and i think that's the shadow knocking at your door it's the unconscious uh almost revealing to yourself um that it's worth to take a look where you haven't looked before yeah uh. yeah i know when i think of shadow I think so much of of my own conditioning and how I took on as a little girl a view of like a reality of what the world meant and how I fit in it. And and I think the deeper I've gone into my own spiritual journey and just really unpacking my conditioning, the more I've seen that I didn't even know there were other choices. There's just a certain way that I operated and there was nothing outside of those bounds that I was even aware to look at or to question. And so there's something I think about the shadow is it's just aspects of self that are just kind of right here that we may not know if we're not stretching beyond our sense of reality. Mm-hmm. And you had a question earlier. I think it's probably worth exploring like what's important about this work as it relates to integral leadership, right? So like Mm -hmm. as as a move from reactive to creative, we're growing our awareness of some of that conditioning so that more choices are available. We can notice the unconscious pattern and choose something consciously uh, in place of it that might serve better. What are the limitations of that? Or what is it that, you know, you've touched on it a little bit with the, the sense of constriction, Rix, but what is it that someone operating in a creative may begin to experience that would have them wanting to continue this journey or needing to continue this journey uh, and expand into integral? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Great question. Yeah, what comes to mind is I, um, a while ago, I coached a leader 
who was, I think, at the max of her system, um, very, you know, effective leader, intelligent, um, charismatic, um, very, um, you know, it achieved great results. Uh, the team loved working for her, with her, um, but she was really a go-getter, like always in action mode. Uh, either communicating or deciding, you know, very action-oriented. Until she also realized that she became a bit impulsive. Uh, but she didn't want to move towards, you know, the opposite of movement would be stillness, right? And she, she just hated going there because it made her internally uh, restless, but I guess we found a way to explore that um, so she could tap into, you know, being still within herself, uh, opening up also to, you know, visioning, um, sensing, uh, pausing, sensing and responding to what was needed within the organization that she was leading. Um, so sitting still, doing mindfulness wasn't her thing. We tried it. Uh, <laughs> listening to bird sounds at least that was helpful because it gave her something to do while being still mm -hmm. but she found out what she really loved and what kind of expanded her uh, possibilities and capabilities was to walk slowly during lunchtime so we would I, I would meet her once in a while and we would go out for a hike and uh, she was almost as tall as I was, but she was walking so much faster than I did. So I said to her, you know, what's the rush, right? <laughs> Where are we? <laughs> and, um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She was noticing she was walking really fast. So by just noticing that and learning to walk slower, she found her way to create some, you know, let's call it still movement, Right. And with that, she opened up to, you know, become a bit more um, reflective mm -hmm. and to pause before getting into action. So I think, you know, talking about becoming integral uh, as a leader um, to also add stillness to movement, mm -hmm. um, you create a new way of, of, of being. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that example. Rob, do you want to add anything to that? Well, what I like about that is the, you know, the, the symptom of one of those disowned parts is like any coming anywhere near it's, uh, it's positive aspect feels like it's negative aspect. Right. So like for a person who has prioritized achievement and fast pace and work ethic and anything close to stillness sounds like laziness, right? It's like, it gets taken to its pathological extreme, even just in considering incorporating the positive aspect of it. And so it's, it's amazing to see people in the process of even just beginning to open to some small version of a movement on the spectrum of a polarity like that. Mm -hmm. um, and just how challenging it can be, right? You just by asking someone to sit still for 10 minutes or, you know, go a little slower as they're walking exposes the internalized resistance or, or the attachment to being a particular way, or in this case in shadow work to not being a particular way. Mm -hmm. It's not okay to be that for me is kind of the internal dialogue mm. that's running. Right. Yeah. It, it ties so directly into, I think one of the cultural shadows, which is especially in organizations, it can be about achieving, accomplishing, producing, and fortunately there's a lot of evolution that's been happening, but I know for myself, I, I definitely didn't know how to slow down in the early part of my career. I was type A triathlete, like everything I did was hard and fast. And there's something that I was actually, I had accolades for doing that. You know, it's like my environment was encouraging me to do that. So it's really powerful that we're talking about like, what's the individual shadow and, but how does it get reinforced in our culture? And how do we bring awareness to that? Like, what if rest is actually the medicine, not more doing? Even when our nervous system tells us otherwise, how do we begin to send that message to each other mm -hmm. and to systems within systems? 
So that's what struck me. Yeah, Ron. This is fantastic. So yeah, we can start to play with what are these different sort of layers of shadow and how do we begin to actually do some of this work? Because there is that important sort of first person, second person, third person aspect of shadow work where I've either I've taken it and it's not okay for me to be that, but you're doing that. And then sort of the next stage is, well, we don't do that, but they do. It becomes he, she, they, it becomes the, the sort of thing embodying the thing. It's not okay for me to be. Yeah. And so one of the processes is a three, two, one going backwards is can we actually take aspects of that and bring it into from third person to second and look for where is that here also. Mm. And so I'm curious, you know, even in our conversation, I wonder what are some of the things we may not be noticing that may be yeah. happening right here, right? Yeah. Um, and then from those into me, what are the things I'm not, in what way is that actually showing up as an aspect of me? Mm. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to explore. <laughs> yeah, I like making it real, bringing it to us. Rix, do you want to add anything to that or... Anything spark for you around the three layers? Yeah, well, it's intriguing, right? So what's not here or what's not being said? Um, it's always interesting to see, uh, to at least ask that question and see if we can mm -hmm. come up with something. What's not What's not in our conversation that might be um, part of our shadow together, right? Mm -hmm. And um, um, the thing about shadow, it's behind us, right? So it's difficult to see. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is probably an essential thing to name, right? Is like the that is it's a nice idea to think that we can do shadow work and then it's done. But mm. by nature, by nature of being a human being, you will forever not see something. Yeah. And, yeah. and acknowledging that incompleteness of our perspective is is one of the humbling and discomforting aspects of starting to include this as part of your personal work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will yeah. say, you know, <laughs> one of the ways it may be showing up right now, at least for me, is we talk about the shadow work that's needed in the world versus like, oh, I'm in this work. This is my challenge as well. Mm -hmm. Making sure I speak from that first person. Yeah. It reminds me of, you know, how, how I have read and heard about many indigenous tribes and I was a restorative, restorative justice facilitator for a while, so we based it on this, is that when one person in the community is acting out in a certain way or, or, or struggling in a certain way, the question in the sh for the shaman in the community that, you know, w within the, the environment is to say, what is happening within us that's causing that? Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of both... You know, what, how are we contributing? Like you were saying, Rob, it's like, well, how am I creating that shadow out there, or that implication out there? But also that if it's manifesting in one, it's manifesting everywhere. So this is one of the reasons why I think answering that question, why is this work important? Is that if we have the courage to do this within ourselves, not only are we starting to see more within ourselves, we can compassionately see more in other people, which is what elicits more of these conversations. So mm -hmm. that just struck me of just how the integration and the wholeness of, of, of how it lives in all of us and the power of turning inward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think as, as practitioners, as, as coaches, consultants, therapists or healers, however we want to call ourselves, um, it's important to to do both right to to listen to podcasts or read about shadow work and then um, also to do our own work and to have um, conversations with peers and self-reflect and um, to keep on um, looking at ourselves and and seeing do we are we congruent uh, are we showing up <laughs> in the way that we talk about um you know for example shadow work or integral leadership and i also think that it's not um it's not a permanent stage that you're in so once you've done your shadow work you're integral yeah. <laughs> and that's where you are right <laughs> we go back and forth from uh, whatever um reactive to creative to integral and and sometimes we see these glimpses maybe of, of integral uh within others or within ourselves uh, and then we go back to well, just look at myself when when at eleven thirty 
um, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit hungry and I feel like having lunch already. I become really grumpy. I, I can be, become really reactive. <laughs> so, um, so it's just to, to keep yourself honest as well and saying, yeah, although I've done all the work, doesn't mean that I'm, I'm there yet. I have arrived. Yeah. I love that you both have spoken to that. So I just want to highlight the power of, of, recognizing this, this is not about a destination where we uncover our shadow and we're integrated and whole. I think for me, the integration is actually the continual exploration and continually calling these, I'm going to call them exiled parts, unseen parts back Mm -hmm. home. And that is so incredibly difficult when they're, for me personally, when there's shame associated with the parts of me that I don't want to see. You know, I'm very self-reliant. I, from six years old on, I was cooking my own meals, figuring out the world. And so for me to be needy as an adult is so incredibly difficult. And I've done so much work over the last 20 years, but it is so powerful to be able to recognize that the only way I can have compassion towards these parts of me is to know that they just cycle through, new layers cycle through, and it's not about getting somewhere. It's actually about embracing them every time they rise. That's the integration for me, is the compassionate embrace of like, oh, here that part is again, or a new part. So I wonder if you two have any thoughts for you personally about you know, bringing it back home. Like, How do you work with your own journey with shadow for you? And then maybe we could talk more about how you do it with clients Hmm. i can yeah i'll offer maybe a couple examples one is because it resonated for me you're speaking about your work with your client rick's about you know walking walking quickly and just kind of moving quickly through life and this aversion to stillness or to a different kind of pace i think that's uh something i'm still very much in process of learning to respect cycles and rhythms and uh, the more natural uh, gestation periods of things and, and letting things unfold in their more organic pace and honoring rest. And, you know, it's funny because I can even, I notice I'm even, I spin thriving sometimes even into a new tool for more productivity, right? It, it comes back to more of that. And so for me, the work is, uh, you know, what is the, what is the part of me that I've made not okay? Um, that even slowing down starts to expose and make me uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was caught by your language of neediness and Marie, just the, like that, where, where does the line of honoring a need become neediness, right? That even the idea of a need becomes needy <laughs> is an example of that jump all the way to the pool. Right. And totally. so how do we, <laughs> You know, and so for me, where does, you know, where does deep rest have a place and how do I bring more of that into being allowed in my sense of identity? Um, And the other is more on a macro scale of, you know, I have this passion around contributing to a regenerative economy and I have to constantly be looking at and how am I complicit in creating not that on a Mm -hmm. daily basis in my own purchasing decisions in my own. And so those are two examples for me of how it's very much in my daily life. Um, and I find it, it's difficult to do shadow work alone. So I'm finding I really need to be in dialogue about these things and asking for this to be noticed around me. Mm. Beautiful examples. Mm. Yeah. And I guess for me, um, um, it felt two years ago, I started to explore my shadow self, um, because I was asked to do bigger projects, bigger, um, lead certain meetings. And so my potential, I guess, was seen by others, but I didn't see it myself and it gave me sleepless nights. And I was wondering where it came from. Um, And uh, with some help, um, I discovered, I think, um, and I think we all do this around midlife, (laughs) whether that's around 40 or 60, um, we we start to see our whole selves, maybe, 
And with that, um, also maybe the alternative side of that. So I think as as humans, we we are conditioned and we grow towards the light. So our caregivers, our parents, the system around us um, encourage us to become a certain way. And, you know, so certain aspects of ourselves are put in the light. Um, and then because you grow to, towards that um, certain identity of yourself, you're blind to the the identity that you didn't create so all of a sudden um you see the whole picture of you and you also see the whole shadow of you which is quite a shock i mean to me it was quite a shock like i've done all that developmental work uh, i kind of knew what irritated me the shadow i projected on other people sometimes um and then all of a sudden i saw this this, this narrative, this identity that I created for myself that became too small. Um, and it was a, um, I had to go back to my childhood, to my innocent and my younger self um, to see, you know, how have I built up this identity which gave me protection which I needed to survive, as we all need as children to create, to be loyal to our caregivers and to our, our parents, um, to feel safe and secure. Mm -hmm. um, but with that, I also made a choice, unconsciously, of course, yeah. um, to become a certain person. And can I, can I reconsider, <laughs> or can I consider when I go back, and the, the, the separate kind of shadow sides that you see, does this make any sense? <laughs> Absolutely. I, Rob, do you want to say anything? I would just echo that completely. Yeah, the, the, and the depth of identity work is, I think, part of, you know, you asked about how is this showing up in the world right now, Anne-Marie. I think people experiencing that limitation of the identity that they've lived into, even, even though they've fully lived into, it's still been a, a sort of a partial kind of identity and that there's so much more outside the circle that you've called identity than maybe inside it. Mm -hmm. And that that puts us at a more challenging or perhaps less effective place in dealing with people who embody aspects that are outside my circle that I've made okay to be. And so that we see the polarization, we see the regression into needing to kind of collapse into reinforced identity instead of being open to expanded identity, the discomfort of that. So that's what comes up for me, mm -hmm. what about for you. You know, as I was listening, Rex, I feel that you're really onto an important piece. So when I, years ago, I did something called Hakomi. It's a body-centered psychotherapy training. And in that, we studied this meth methodology about character strategies and how from our developmental stage from, you know, early, and I know we, the, there's many of much of this actually in the leadership circle work too, where there's five basic needs, you know, the need for safety, the need to connect, the need for power, the need for freedom, and the need to feel valued. And we go through that arc. And as we go through them, if we have missing experiences, let's say in the area of power, if we don't feel like we have our sovereign self, we will create adaptive strategies. And those become shadow to us because they just become the way that we see the world. And so what I have found working with leaders and, and certainly with myself, like this has been my primary work, is being able to befriend the character strategies gives me so much more freedom and power, mm -hmm. like power from the place of love, power mm -hmm. from a place of, oh, I can really see that in myself. And the more I see that in myself, I'm less triggered when I'm with someone else that's playing out that same strategy. Mm -hmm. So there's been something so powerful for me about that frame and, and really using it as a lens towards myself and all things. So yeah, that came up for me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and that brief befriending, um, so connecting to that disowned part of yourself mm -hmm. and actually um, finding a way to love it, integrate it again, 
or integrated? Um, is there a way to shift from I am this authentic self to I am many selves? <laughs> Right. And then yeah. you can turn that whatever you disowned in yourself or you don't identify with because you've, n- you've never s- realized that um, you start to love it and integrate it. It then becomes your gift. <laughs> it yes. becomes, you know, as Oprah Winfrey says, your wound becomes your wisdom. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and with that, you can hold so much easier opposing views Mm -hmm. because the other in me (laughs) could see it that way right well I'm seeing it that way (laughs) so the other side of me um, so you can hold different perspectives and when we can hold different perspectives um, you know we have more wisdom Mm -hmm. and we become inclusive Mm -hmm. uh, towards ourselves right we're not discriminating or ignoring a certain part of ourselves but we're seeing that part of ourselves that we've disowned for many many years uh for a reason right i think our our parents uh, raise us a certain way because they they um they love us they most of us you know they, they care for us so they encourage us to become a certain way um but by integrating that what we ignored about ourselves and starting to compassionate uh, love that part of ourselves again um we can you know we can turn that into a gift and i think jung said the shadow is pure gold yeah. right so there is so much more yeah uh, that you know harvesting the shadow uh is what, what makes us will make us um integrate or unite uh, those those um, paradoxes that you talked about in the beginning of the, mm-hmm. of the podcast, Anne Marie, mm-hmm. and we we all talk about you know diversity and inclusion in organizations, right? But I think we first need to do our own job and and you know be inclusive towards all the parts within ourselves in order to to bring that into the system. Exactly. Yeah. That just rings so true. Go ahead, Rob. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, I would just say that's this is where this is becoming so important, right? And it, if we link it to some of this stage theory stuff and in integral and this sort of opportunity for more of that, uh, the discomfort in a socialized structure of mind when we have one objective reality, there's a, is it this way or is it not? And when it's, you mean that's not how it is, is so discomforting. Mm -hmm. Um, So we we learn to then see, okay, well, that's how I see it. And I understand that someone else could see it differently. And that opens up all kinds of new possibilities for collaboration and for teaming in different ways in the, in the creative stage. And then this, what we're talking about is now building the muscle of acknowledging, not only do I recognize someone else could see it differently, I know that there could be things that neither of us are seeing. (laughs) And I'm actually growing a capacity to be in that discomfort of the not seeing and not knowing. And And the more we can do that, the more new perspectives can become available, the more new options rather than what have we always done or what's familiar to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where, you know, because here we are in a time in the world where if we keep doing what's been done, we're in some trouble. Yeah. And if we can't open to not only including each other's perspectives, but looking beyond each of our and our collective perspective to what's not known yet, what's not been done yet. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's where some of this gets very practically real in terms of addressing some of these challenges we're facing today and disconnection from self, disconnection from each other and disconnection from the rest of the living world. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it speaks to me, Rob, what you just said about learning and, and being comfortable with not knowing we have in the Netherlands where I live, we have a new cabinet and we just have a new minister for uh, education, culture and research. And he used to, um, for the last 10 years, he was leading the Princeton uh, Institute for Advanced Studies. So he's a professor in mathematical physics. 
returning back to the Netherlands, now becoming this minister. And so he was asked on his first day, <laughs> when he just joined uh, by a journalist, something like, so how was your first day? Any insights, plans, whatever? And so this very bright, wise man answered, um, you know, I'm like a little duckling crawling out of an egg. <laughs> Just, uh, you know, eyes and ears wide open, learning. Uh, I'm, I'm really new to this job. So please come back to me in a couple of months and I, I might be able to give you a more sensible answer. Which I thought was just a wonderful glimpse of integral leadership. Um, you know, he could have blown us all away with a metaphor of um, whatever black holes in, <laughs> in the universe. And he gave us this beautiful image of this duckling. Um, so I think that um, I, I don't know how he, how he will do, but that was a, a great example of integral leadership, I think. Yeah, that's such a beautiful imagery. And, and there's something so, so humble about that, mm. which I think is part of the integral quality. Rob, are you going to yeah. add something? No, that's okay. what I, I love it. Yeah. Me too. Similarly, the willingness to sort of lay it down is one of the aspects I think of in terms of integral leadership, right? It's a, I will become whoever's needed in order to serve rather yes. than I will become my full self and have my impact, right? It's sort of a, mm. of laying down again of identity and saying, okay, well, who is needed here and how do I become what is needed mm. in order to serve what's, what's asked. Mm. And how do we do that if we're not continually a baby duckling? Right. Our eye, you know, our ear, like sen all our senses are first coming online and we've never sensed or smelled anything. Like at what if every moment was like that? Or how do we cultivate that in ourselves? And I think it's important to acknowledge it's easy to make this sound really great, but it's <laughs> terrifying and it's uncomfortable, you know? Thanks for the, saying that. The yeah. experience of coming out of an egg again for the first time, you know, it's, it's, letting go of all of the things that have made you feel at ease, comfortable, accepted, valued. It's sort of like mm -hmm. not letting go forever, but willing to lay them down or suspend them and open to something different. It's really, it's difficult work. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 And I think reinventing yourself or being on that threshold, um, requires some kind of innocence mm -hmm. right and that is a hard place to be in um especially when you feel you're established or you, you know like you said rob what you've achieved so far yeah, yeah. you know yeah so i think you know it would be wonderful if we could um, um be humble heroes right or uh, savvy humanists or the global minded uh, localists or you know how can we <laughs> combine all these great um, polarities um, yeah which is needed in the world so mm. much so so on a really practical note I want to circle back to something because I think Rob you posed the question earlier for the three of us to look at of what is it that we're not seeing mm. and so we can go there, but there's also one more piece that's coming up for me is, as you just named, Rob, you put a layer around, this is what, how do we create a new world? How, essentially, how do humans evolve to a certain point where there is a new way that we can be on the planet? And how do we discover what that new way is? So basically what you are pointing to is how do we expose what we haven't seen yet? And so I'm wondering if either of you have suggestions when you work with people, you know, like, let's say listeners right now are saying, well, that sounds cool. Okay. Like, how do I see what I, how do I see what I can't see? Clearly you've named, we need to be in relationship. We need help. But is there more that you could say for listeners about whether it's an organization exploring this and a team or an individual of how do you recommend people go about revealing the unseen, opening into what has never been seen before? Mm. It's a pretty big question. So just see whatever arises, if there's anything there. I mean, one thing that comes up for me is the, the practice of walking questions, like in a very Rilke kind of way, like mm -hmm. 
let the questions work you. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that I'm trying to practice more often is the question of what am I not seeing? What might I be missing? What, um, what other perspectives need to be included? So just really living in the, not only do I not know, but I can't know. And so how might I include more? Uh, mm -hmm. That's a quick one that comes up for me. What about for you, Rex? Yeah, what comes up for me was going back to Jung's statement. So what's the opposite choice of the choice we're making just to consider the opposite of, of whatever uh, we're deciding or talking about? Um, and what am I othering or what are we othering mm -hmm. in other groups or other organizations or teams or whatever? So what are we projecting uh, and what does that tell us about our shadow? Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a quote from, I guess, uh, Sigmund Freud, someone asked him, you know, if you could sum up psychotherapy in a single sentence and he said, where it was there, I now become. Huh. And that to me is a beautiful summary of this. So where is the it and how do I become that? How does there's this enveloping um, process that, mm -hmm again is a little bit abstract and it's a way to think about it but as a practice it's just underlining what rick's is saying that where have i othered something and how do i get over there and be there yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. yeah i think for myself i'm finding that creating a safe environment where there's room to be really messy and not have things buttoned up and not know and start these conversations is where I find myself expanding the most right now. I'm running a program um, basically about exploring integrated masculinity. And we had our first call this week and I, I, I was so moved by basically all being in this container where we're committed to being messy, whatever that looks like. And what has been arising as a result of that is we're saying things and we're feeling things and we're catching ourselves in the, in, in the moment as we're sharing where there's some belief system that's so tight we didn't see it. But there, for me, and, and I'm leading this thing and I saw this huge shadow come up and you know named it and explored it, but it, that would not have come up for me had I not been in the field with other people who are kind of holding their own. And I don't even think there were, it, there weren't words that were said. It was the facial expressions that I saw that helped something ricochet inside of me and go, oh, that's an important thing to look at. Mm. I hadn't seen that before. And so then we kind of like followed this whole path. So maybe that's our final exploration here is just the power of we don't do this alone. So maybe both of you could say something about how being in relationship or being in whatever kind of group format is supportive for you and what the elements are that make that supportive. Mm. Yeah. Um. Well, I think these kinds of conversations are really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think, Rob, you initiated now continuous conversations around shadow work within the leadership circle community, which is, I think, really helpful um, to keep on learning, right? So expand your knowledge, the, the theories, um, methodologies, whatever you prefer to keep on, um, you know, becoming masterful of that um, in combination with self-awareness around how do I relate to myself? How do I relate to others? Because our, our, our work is around relating mm -hmm. um, and doing that by maybe peer to peer coaching. I, I, I'm really helped by also having a, a mentor uh, who, who looks at, you know, we look together at my coaching practice um, personal development, but also my coaching um, development as, as a professional. Um, so to be, and also to focus on my own growth. I think if you, 
in a coach, you look for someone who's helping you to grow. So I would like to work with someone who's interested in growing themselves. It's like when you go out and buy an electrical car, you want a salesperson who owns an electrical car and not a diesel. <laughs> yeah. Right? So someone who's invested in their own personal growth. Um, because um, I think when we keep on learning on this knowledge and also practical or hard mind and, and, and soul level, then our interventions come from a deeper place. Um, and that shows up in your, your being, not only your doing, but your being. And with that, you create a different space that's safe and courageous where uh, people can make that transformation. Um, so I wouldn't go for one spot, you know, this is the, the thing to do, but have a variety of, of, um, of things to explore for yourself. That's great. Thank yeah, you. Very well said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. You know, the foundationally, there's a, a commitment to making this a part of your practice and a part of how you're growing. And then the many channels for exploring, you know, knowledge and information and being in relationship with someone directly, maybe in a one-on-one -on -one where that work is more focused for you, creating shared spaces where that can be explored together. Mm -hmm. The idea of exploring it in a shared space is, is interesting because you've got so much more opportunity to expose shadow, especially the more different aspects you've invited into a group, because you can start to see very quickly, there are things I'm othering even right now in this moment, right? What's different about Anne-Marie from me and how have I made that not a part of myself? And so mm -hmm. there's lots of material. It also opens up the possibility for a lot of reinforcement of shadow. So, for example, you know, I, I noticed myself in, in this conversation just by virtue of here we are on a podcast and I'm with these very intelligent, powerful women. I need to sound smart or say something in a particular way. Right. So I have the there's there's a shadow there around expertise that I feel pulled into where, you know, your comment about messiness just really touched my heart. And Maria was sort of like, OK, so what if that could be let go, you know, what does imperfection look like modeled in this scenario? And um, so the, the, the shared space really has this way of potentially exposing, but also potentially reinforcing what's unconscious. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an essential tool and has to be approached with an extra degree of, of respect and awareness. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think fundamentally it's a commitment to say oh okay as i learn about what shadow is i will make that a part of what i'm always asking yeah and i have no idea because <laughs> i'm just learning about this too every day right it's yeah, duckling. But that's, that's my sense at this stage right yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. so rich yeah thank you for sharing that piece around if, you know, just being so transparent in this moment about where you are actually seeing one arise, where, where, the, uh, where you are tracking the other, othering, checking in around, you know, the perception of how you thought you should, or this one part of you basically thinking you need to be a certain way. And then another part of you coming in and going, oh, wait, you know, there's that, but there's also just, what if it could just be messy? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. or imperfect, I think is what you said. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are coming towards the end of our time. I just want to see if there's anything that either of you feel hasn't been named today about shadow and the importance of turning towards this individually and collectively or anything else that a thread that we might have had back there that you feel like, oh, I want to add this. Anything else? Yeah, I... I um about the collective shadow, what I think is interesting, what I found out about myself, which I think might speak to um, the community of coaches and therapists, healers, mm -hmm. consultants, is that I tend to see myself as a better listener than a speaker. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes with our profession, right? So we... Yeah. we <laughs> Well, you know, it's, it's also needed, right? So that's what we, how we become great coaches. Um, 
And there is something about um, the collective shadow within, I think, organizations, families, cultures, society, but also the planet, um, that uh, we tend to uh, choose um, power over love. We choose, uh, we prefer confidence over connection. Mm-hmm. Um, we, um, so, so we, I think, you know, for the last couple of thousand years, we've kind of undervalued the feminine values mm-hmm. uh, and maybe overvalued the, the masculine values, which doesn't say anything about gender. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I think if we want to make a shift, uh, which is necessary for our planet to survive, um, we should use our voices and speak up more. Mm-hmm. And so for that, maybe stepping into um, our shadow or maybe the side that we don't, we less identify with, which is using our voice um, and using it to build connection, um, to, to restore um, the balance um, that is needed between the feminine and the masculine values so (laughs) thank you for asking that question because i do feel that is um that is important in my personal journey Mm -hmm. so this was you know for me (laughs) being on a podcast doing more speaking than listening is for me it's not what i identify mostly with so thank you so much for challenging me (laughs) but i also think this is part of our community uh, of coaches Mm -hmm. um and so and 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 we are a movement um in the world Mm -hmm. and so we uh, i like all of us uh, to speak up more invite all of you to um to express use your expertise to um build connection um connect um unite um, paradoxes um because it's needed yeah Mm, I love what you just brought in. Yeah, thank you for that. You're welcome. Mm. Rob, do you want to add anything? Yeah, from my perspective, um, recognizing what I represent sometimes or pretty much every time, wherever I go, um, taking the reverse of what Rick's just shared is to know when to be silent and to simply underline when wisdom has been shared by a a powerful woman. So I would just say ditto. Beautiful. Thank you. Mm. Well, I want to just bookmark as we transition that there could be another episode where we really explore this whole notion of the the integration of feminine and masculine energies in in the context of yin and yang and how mm-hmm. much that is a shadow and how does that appear and because it does feel such rich territory to make room for all of that too and how that plays out so thank you both this was so rich and i'm so glad we have a part 2 so mm-hmm. for listeners we'll be back and we're going to again in the second round we're going to be talking with rix about a process that she took people through do you want to say anything actually about that right now just to give people a, a taster of of yeah um so spontaneous what i can say about it that it's um um, so it, it's a process towards integral, which includes shadow work. Mm-hmm. So it's it's really a holistic process. So it includes um, mind, body, heart and soul mm-hmm. uh, exploration within an executive coaching assignment. Um, and I think that brings a very interesting tension in itself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're going to walk us through what you designed for this executive mm-hmm. coaching packet program. And then, and then you'll be able to share with whatever level of confidentiality, what mm-hmm. the process was like. And so we can, gosh, there's a part of me that would love to have it be live so we can have people ask questions, but we'll see how we want to do that because I think there'll be so much that, you know, Rob and I can play with extracting things, but um, 
yeah, I, I'm just thinking on the fly. We'll see how we want to do it. But that it sounds like you're going to walk us through a process and share the, the victories and the challenges and, and maybe even a model that other coaches could be playing with, um, mm-hmm. how you could be offering more around that to other people. So, yeah. Yeah. So I would just share the process and it doesn't mean that that is, um, you know, that's, that's the process you should follow. Uh, it was just one client uh, and it worked out very well and just take from it, whatever you think is useful. Love it. And your, to your point, I think, yeah, we will look for opportunities. We're trying to pull peer groups together. Anyone who's interested in learning and being a part of these types of dialogues, um, you know, whether it's showcasing, Rick's has this amazing case study, um, or whether it's just being in dialogue about our own work together, uh, all the way across that spectrum, we're creating a community around this conversation. So if you're curious, reach out and come and be a part of it with us, please. Great. Mm. And so for people to reach out, I'm going to have both of your information in the show notes, just so listeners know, if you want to learn more about Rick's and right. Rob, that will be there. And then um, my understanding is there's going to be some offerings to come for people to engage more. And so I'll make sure that uh, listeners have a place to access that. Perfect. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you for so having much. me. Uh, it's such a pleasure. And we'll be back, be with you shortly, soon. I hope you enjoyed the show today. If you want more, you can subscribe to this channel. This will automatically queue up the next episode for your listening. If you have a burning question or topic you want to learn more about, please send an email to Ask Anne Marie. The direct link is located in the show notes. And please leave a review. This keeps me inspired and focused to bring you more. If you want to learn more about my work as a power reclamation guide, leadership coach, and organizational culture consultant, you can visit my websites in the notes. Thank you again for joining today.